Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and Peggy Smith and their dogs. So the other day I was scrolling through my feed on the platform formerly known as Twitter and I, when I came across what appeared to be a major scandal and needless to say, Mainstream media are not talking about this. Let me show you. The post is from Adam Rowland, Master of Science, who is actually one of my followers. This is what he said. This has been brought to my attention unbelievably bad. So AstraZeneca UK quietly submitted their clinical trial data as part of their application to have their license withdrawn. Yet no mainstream media outlet reported on this, yet choose to continue the rare blood clots smokescreen. One to 34 serious adverse events, immediately life-threatening, hospitalisation, persistent or significant disability. NB, COVID infection was classified as a non-serious event. A higher percentage of the vaccinated got COVID than the unvaccinated, yet MRHA Government UK approved this vaccine as safe and effective. This is negligence on a criminal scale. See for yourself. And there's a link where you can download PDF trial data. He then says, please correct me if I'm wrong. I pray I'm wrong. And there's a couple of screenshots from the trial data, which I will cover later. And he's also copied a number of media outlets on his post. As far as I can tell, none of them have run with the story, which either means they are all trying to hide the truth or the post is total bollocks. No prizes for guessing which it is. Anyway, he did say, please correct me if I'm wrong and I pray I'm wrong. So he's going to be very happy to know that he is in fact wrong. But you may be wondering where this crazy claim came from in the first place. Well, it appears to have been originally made by a guy called Eden Biber, who, according to his substack, is a cybersecurity and privacy professional who became investigative journalist, exposed pharmaceutical contracts vaccine dangers, European energy market failures. Now, based on his idea of investigative journalism, I think he should probably go back to being a cybersecurity and privacy professional because, quite frankly, his investigative skills kind of suck. Anyway, according to him, he has uncovered the real reason that AstraZeneca decided to withdraw their vaccine from sale. He has found some serious issues with their safety study. I'll just read you a little bit of his substack so you can follow the argument. Notice that the placebo group is about 50% in size of the group that received the product AZ. This means that any adverse events, serious adverse events, medically attended adverse events and adverse events of special interest throughout the study should have had half of the number of events in the group that received the product. It didn't. And he's got proof of this. Just look at this table. As you can see, the adverse events in the AstraZeneca group are more than double the adverse events in the placebo group. Of course, this is exactly what you'd expect to see. Vaccines are designed to elicit an immune response, and that means that some people will experience adverse events like headache, fever, muscle aches, etc., following vaccination. This is not the gotcha he thinks it is. But wait! He's got another table, and this one is looking at serious adverse events, medically attended adverse events, and adverse events of special interest. And it still shows more than double the number of adverse events in those who got the vaccine. 
Could it mean that there's a serious problem with the vaccine that all the scientists and medical authorities missed? Should we all be thanking the plucky investigative journalists for uncovering this shocking information? Basically, no. He's just failed to read the description of the table. And this is the sentence that he's failed to read. Different follow-up times between AZD1222 and placebo groups. 20,223 versus 3,893 participant years. In other words, the reason there are more people suffering from adverse events in the vaccine group is because they were followed up for a lot longer than the people in the placebo group. If you take this into consideration, you will see that there aren't more serious adverse events in the vaccine group. Using participant years as a denominator, you can see that there are 3.1% serious adverse events in the vaccine group versus 3.5% in the placebo group. There are 23.5 medically attended adverse events in the vaccine group versus 32.3% in the placebo group. And there are 12.4 adverse events of special interest in the vaccine group versus 15.2% in the placebo group. So in each case, the placebo group has a higher proportion of people suffering serious adverse events. Although it's worth mentioning that this isn't necessarily an apples to apples comparison as we are comparing different time periods. And if you're wondering why this is the case, people in the placebo group were offered the vaccine once the initial analysis was complete after the first endpoint was met. This meant that they couldn't be followed after that because they were no longer in the placebo group but the vaccine group could be followed for a full two years. Now I'm sure about now there's probably a lot of anti-vaxxers screaming that they should have been left in the placebo group, blah, blah, blah. There is a very good reason why they weren't. At the cutoff date of the 5th of March 2021, Eight people in the placebo group had severe or critical COVID-19 compared with zero in the vaccine group. And this was at a time when the total number of cases was only 130 in the placebo group and 73 in the vaccine group. If the people in the placebo group had remained unvaccinated, a large number of them would have ended up with severe or critical COVID-19. Vaccinating them considerably reduced this number. Only an asshole wouldn't want to see this reduction. Anyway, back to the substack. Believe it or not, the crazy claims actually get even more crazy. Here's the paragraph after the misinterpreted tables. Why are there any adverse events with the placebo? We don't know what placebo they used. And if they didn't use a saline placebo, e.g. flu shot, the adverse events in that group could relate to the components of the shots. Now, I don't mean to be rude, but this guy isn't much of an investigative journalist if he couldn't find out what placebo they used. The information is included in the trial data that he has supposedly read. They did use a saline placebo. So no, the adverse events in that group don't relate to the components of the shots. This is a common mistake made by anti-vaxxers. They confuse adverse events with side effects. They seem unaware that people develop medical conditions every day. And just because a medical condition develops after a vaccine, it doesn't mean the vaccine was a cause, even if that adverse event occurred very close to the vaccination. If a large number of people are receiving vaccines, it is expected that some of them will have an adverse event 
close to the vaccine. And if a large number of people are getting saline placebos, it is expected that some of them will also have an adverse event close to the injection. That's why the trial shows adverse events in people who got placebo. But wait, there's more. The investigative journalist also said this. Now look at the adverse events table, which, as far as I know, was the one that was reported to the regulator. It left me puzzled, as it seemed to be completely not in line with the results I've mentioned above. Why the discrepancy? We can't tell with no analysis. Serious adverse events, blah, blah, blah. Again, all he had to do was read the information in the table that he included in his substack. It clearly says, adverse events data reported for double blind period only. This means this table only includes the data from the initial period before those in the placebo group were offered vaccines. It's inconsistent with the other table because the other table included data for two years and, as we previously discussed, had a longer follow-up period for those who were vaccinated compared with those who received placebo. Now, I would just like to go back to the post by Adam Rowland, Master of Science. He said in this post, one to 34 serious adverse events. When I first saw it, I thought he was saying that there were 30 times more serious adverse events in the vaccine group compared with the placebo group. And I couldn't for the life of me work out how we had come up with that number. But eventually I did. What he is saying here is that one in 34 people who got the vaccine had a serious adverse event. This is in fact true, but it doesn't mean what Mr. Rowland thinks it means. He is making the mistake of assuming that an adverse event is a side effect that we discussed earlier. All the data is showing is that over a period of two years, one in 34 people will have some kind of adverse event. There is no reason to think any of these adverse events are related to the vaccine, just like there is no reason to think that the higher incidence of adverse events in the placebo group when corrected for the shorter time period are related to the saline placebo. Anyway, I'm sure Mr Rowland will be very happy when I let him know this information. One more thing that I do want to make clear is that although the trial data doesn't show that people are more likely to have serious adverse events with the vaccine than with the placebo, it doesn't mean that rare serious vaccine side effects don't occur. We know that they do, and as I've said before, this is tragic. But we also know that COVID vaccines have prevented a lot of serious illness and saved a lot of lives. If you would like to read more of the trial data that we covered in this video, I've provided a link in the video's description. And please remember that this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy a treat. And we'll probably also maybe share some of those treats with Peggy who made a great contribution at the start of the video. We all really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to join the cool kids and stay informed, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.